Welcome to Archaeology Abridged with Dr. Patrick Hunt. Today we will be uh, receiving a lecture on the fall of civilizations, famine, and climate change. This is just a reminder that this lecture is being recorded by the AIA. It is a live presentation and recording by attendees is strictly prohibited. The AIA respects the intellectual property of its presenters and asks that viewers do the same. Thank you for your cooperation. Hello, I'm Laura Rich, the Vice President of Outreach and Education for the AIA. In the second installment of Archaeology Abridged, I'm delighted to introduce my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Patrick Hunt. Dr. Hunt is an award-winning archaeologist, author, and National Geographic grantee. He earned his PhD in archaeology from the Institute of Archaeology, University College London, and has taught at Stanford University for 25 years. He directed the Stanford Alpine Archaeology Project from 1994 to 2012, and has continued project-related fieldwork in the region in the years since. His Alps research has been sponsored by the National Geographic Society's Expeditions Council, and he frequently lectures for them and others on Hannibal and Utsi the Iceman. He is a national lecturer for us here at the AIA, as well as an elected fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. Patrick has broken 40 bones and is becoming bionic with nine titanium parts in all his limbs. He has survived planes on fire over the Andes, kidnapping ambush in the borderlands of Central America, dodged bullets in the Urubamba Valley, and multiple cliff falls in the Alps. All this in the service of archaeology. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society for his work on Inca landscapes at Pisac, and elected a fellow of the Explorers Club for tracking Hannibal across the Alps and three continents. Dr. Hunt is president of the Stanford chapter of the AIA and has been a member of the AIA since graduate school in 1984. A regular study leader on educational tours, he has led regularly AIA tours of Northern Italy with another one scheduled for 2021 in case you have an opening in your schedule. We are excited to be able to offer this lecture as part of a free series. However, as a nonprofit, the AIA relies on the generosity of supporters like you. If you would like to support AIA initiatives like Archaeology Abridged, we encourage you to donate to the AIA through the website. We truly appreciate your support. And Patrick, it's all yours. It's always a pleasure and an honor uh, to be involved. And I'm thrilled uh, to be able to share a little bit about some research that has taken part of my time and energy uh, and enthusiasm for years, uh, decades, in fact. And I'm going to uh, move to share my screen here shortly. Uh, Laura, thank you for that fun intro. Now, you can see that climate change uh, and the title famine and the fall of civilization uh, is also going to be looking at the four horsemen of the apocalypse because famine is one of the four horses. And you can see a painting uh, 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 of those four horsemen of the apocalypse uh, here in the image. Uh, so this comes out of, uh, you might say religious prophetic literature, but it's really not prophetic only in the sense that history repeats itself. So what has happened before will happen again. Uh, so we can ask ourselves, what are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Uh, now, uh, it's a vision uh, that uh, the tradition tells us was uh, the evangelist Apostle John uh, was taken up uh, sort of on a journey, a fantastic journey, and uh, it's about the end times, so in that sense, it's eschatological, but it's not, as I said, just about the end times, because it's better to ask what were and are and will be the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That, as you know, the word apocalypse is something that comes out of what is hidden, apo, out from, calypse, uh, what is hidden. And when we think about that, this is the text, uh, the original text, from the Apocalypse of John called the Revelation, chapter six. And 
we have Albrecht Durer's famous woodcut here with the four horsemen. And uh, notice that uh, other than going reading every word, uh, this is really germane to verses three and following where it says, these horses came out. The first one you can see in verse two, a white horse. Uh, the rider held a bow, given a crown, rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. The second horse comes out, a fiery red one, power to take peace from the earth. So it's basically war, make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. Then the third one comes out, and this is an interesting set of details. What we'll concentrate on this one tonight. Notice uh, the black horse, a rider holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a day's wages, three quarts of barley for a day's wages. Do not damage the oil and the wine. Now, when you think about a day's wages, uh, which in any given time in history, uh, you know, the, the currency is going to change. But essentially, if you took your monthly salary and divided by about 20, or uh, you took your yearly sa salary and divided that up on a per diem basis, this is actually basically hundreds of dollars for a quart of wheat, um, hundreds of dollars for three quarts of barley. And uh, notice a day's wages here. The actual text says uh, for uh, essentially a denarius, which was the, the equivalent in the Roman era of a day's wages, one silver denarius. Uh, so uh, this means that food is terribly expensive because it's, it's in severe shortage. So this is the third horseman that we call famine. Uh, there's no way uh, that you and I would want to pay a day's wage for uh, a little bit of barley or wheat. Then you see the fourth uh, uh, horse and the pale horse, uh, which is death and hell following close behind. And you may have seen Ingmar Bergman's movie uh, the seventh seal. Uh, and you have all heard that phrase, death on a pale horse riding. So the four horsemen, war, uh, it's, it's not sequential. Uh, here it's sequential, but in history it's not sequential. In fact, uh, famine is usually uh, the first horse that we see followed uh, by disease uh, or plague, uh, and followed by uh, then uh, uh, you know, uh, chaos, uh, uh, war, and then death. And if you look at the last verse there, down in verse eight, it says, these horses were given power over a quarter of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, uh, and, and so on, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So famine is part of this, uh, war through the sword, plague, and so on. And uh, what we know uh, is that this has repeated itself through history many, many times, this sequence. Now, sometimes they're out of sequence. We're right in the middle. Uh, I hope it's beyond the middle. Uh, but the pandemic of coronavirus, uh, you can call it plague if you wish. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it followed, uh, 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 in essence, uh, the, the sequence here. Um, but um, it doesn't also mean that this will be followed by the others, uh, 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 war and death. But famine and, and climate change go hand in hand, and I'm going to come to that in essence quickly. Uh, when we talk about the Holocene, the last 10,000 years, we actually can see climate change has been almost fairly constant, but uh, we don't want to be in the climate denial uh, mode to say that uh, it's not happening right now. Uh, and you know we don't also want to dismiss it by saying it's a given that it's always happened uh, because we are, we are literally uh, in a fast uh, paced climate change mode uh, right now. And we have been for several years. Uh, we hope it doesn't uh, exacerbate and increase uh, uh, even more, but it might. Uh, in fact, prognostication suggests that it will. But so we saw that woodcut of Durer, these four horsemen of the apocalypse, and uh, you can see uh, death on a pale horse riding down here, and you can see 
uh, the sword here, which is war, uh, and you can see famine here with the scales, and this this uh, one with the arrow being shot. Uh, all throughout classical history, the uh, archer gods, uh, Artemis and Apollo, were also gods associated with famine, uh, and even more so plague, particularly plague. So the, the, the bow and plague go hand in hand, bow and arrow archery. Um, and you can see uh, here uh, the way that Durr has interpreted this story. Now, some of you have seen this in the Palazzo Abatellus in Palermo, Sicily. This is death on a pale horse riding. And it's interesting because these are basically the whole panoply of civilization. And you can see kings and popes and prelates and uh, sultans, etc., cetera, uh, leaders down here. And you can see wealthy aristocrats over here. And notice there's an arrow that's just sticking the neck of that lady. And she's just, her eyes have just uh, turned to it because it just struck her. And you can see the other people are generally dead from these arrows. Uh, and these people see something coming. Their eyes are turned toward this, but it hasn't hit them yet. And notice there's a dog barking furiously over here too. Uh, but then there's a group of people over here we want to look at. And the horse of death is almost as skeletal as death himself. And notice the bow. We'll come back to that shortly. But death has passed by. And yet, look, this is a group of the living over here. Let's take a look at them in a close-up, shall we? We have the artist himself. He's holding his brush. He's anonymous. We don't know uh, the artist's name. We just know it's a he. But I want to point out something really interesting. There are some anchoritic monks. Let's just look here. Down here, that's a monk, uh, an anchorite, a uh, hermit. Here's another monk hermit. Another one over here. We have some hermit monks. Then we have a person, and notice the hands are wrapped and there's almost something missing. That person is a leper, but he's spared the pale horse death riding. And you have other individuals who are spared. And I want you to notice these two individuals appear to be wearing Jewish prayer shawls, known as the talit. So what's significant about this picture is that death has passed them by. Why? Well, because the leper is in isolation. The Monks, hermits are in isolation, and they are practicing quarantine. Furthermore, the two Jewish ladies here, if that's what they are, are famous for practicing Levitical laws of quarantine and isolation and washing with water. So it's almost as if we were thinking of today, how do you avoid pandemic? By practicing safe measures of quarantine and isolation. And it is fascinating that even the leper is spared because uh, nobody wants to be near a leper. Uh, and so if you read Leviticus 13 through 17, you see the Jewish laws of sanitation, washing multiple times with water, putting things out for solar exposure, burning tainted materials, and isolate, isolate, isolate. Uh, so uh, it's fascinating that this picture by the anonymous master of death shows plague coming, but sparing some uh, because of their isolation. Now, uh, we can look at global climatic data in so many ways, sea surface temperature, leaf area index, snow cover, night land temperatures. These are fairly recent in the last few decades. Uh, we can you know, see the flux between night and day. We have a lot of satellite data. Now here you're over the Amazon, and notice you have huge swaths of land cleared. And I can tell you, uh, you probably know this, that deforestation causes uh, certainly rising temperatures in a lot of places. Uh, if you're standing in the full sun and you go into the shade, you notice the temperature drop immediately, sometimes as much as 15 to 20 degrees. When we, when we used to drive the Pan American Highway through Central America, I remember uh, 20, 30 years ago, 
the forest came right up to the Pan American Highway. And then two decades later, the forest was on, you could see it, but you weren't uh, in, in the forest because the land had been cleared. And if you go through now parts of Central America, you don't see any vegetation whatsoever because it's all been cleared for uh, either grain or for uh, grazing for animals. So literally, deforestation is a known factor for rising land temperature. Uh, and we, we have this, this devastating picture of Amazon deforestation. And uh, of course, uh, there is warming associated with the deforestation. We can talk about polar ice cap, ice cap fluctuations as well. Uh, we have a lot of data we've recorded uh, about this. And we can even check with uh, isotope levels, oxygen 18 and also uh, deuterium, we can actually chronologically infer data from ice cap fluctuations over thousands of years. Uh, we even have things like lead isotopes from Rome uh, that are in uh, that were buried deep in some of the Greenland ices, but they've been exposed in the last few years. Here, uh, you can just see some places at risk today from flooding uh, along the Ganges River and other rivers, uh, uh, the Irrawaddy, uh, the Mekong, and whatever, uh, uh, because of, of the Brahmaputra. You can just see these are high risk areas to flooding with sea, sea rise. Now, even Florida and the Key Largo, Florida Keys has seen this recently, uh, that they're uh, almost permanently underwater uh, several feet for months at a time now. Uh, and Florida it used to be you couldn't even legally talk about climate change because it was considered uh, verboten. But now it's something that uh, Florida is recognizing and, and is admitting. So I fly over Greenland a lot. Uh, I have it this year, uh, but um, this is a picture I took a few years ago, and I always ask the flight attendants to, to alert me when we're coming along a specific flight pattern, because you follow the, the, uh, the flight control paths, and they're pretty much similar. You don't deviate much from those paths. And when we're over a certain latitude, longitude, I always ask for notification. So this is a picture. I took in 2017 in September. And then uh, a year ago, this was the same exact last year. And the ice caps, the ice of Greenland is definitely uh, melting at an incredible rate. I, I think some of you know that um, a year ago, uh, a billion tons of ice melted in a single day uh, in uh, the Arctic, which had never happened before uh, in late fall. Now, uh, one of the projects I work on is UTSI, and uh, for anyone who doubts climate change, I'll come back to this, uh, anyone who doubts that climate change has uh, um, been uh, overblown, uh, remember that UTSI was in a glacier for 5,000 years without deterioration. And it's only since 1991 that that glacier melted. So for 5,000 years, Utsi was so well preserved, almost cryogenically, by the glacier. And only in 1991 did it melt sufficiently for Utsi to be exposed. So that's proof right there that for 5,000 years in the Alps, in that one context, we've had very stable climate. Not so now. Now, I mentioned Greenland ice. I don't want to go into too much detail, but you can just see uh, over decades the recession of ice or regression of Greenland ice. And one of the problems uh, that we see that's happened historically off and on, the albedo effect, when uh, snow is pure white without any pollution or particles, the light reflects back off, but when it's sooty and dirty, the light's absorbed and the ice melts. That's a NASA phenomenon called the albedo effect. Uh, I mean, it's not made by NASA. NASA has recorded it. Now let's go to the history side here. This is a very simple map of old world chronology. You can see basically four regions, the Near East, Mesopotamia, e Egypt, and Europe. And we have these cultures that we recognize. Uh, for example, we go to the early Bronze Age here, 
so re relatively speaking, from 3000 BCE to about 2000 BCE. Uh, and we have Sumer and Akkad here, the Akkadians, Sumerians and Akkadians in what we call today Iraq, Mesopotamia. Uh, so this would be essentially the rest of the Near East, including Anatolia, Turkey, you know, Turkey and, and the Levant. And then notice here we have your Egyptian uh, uh, pre-dynastic Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom. And then here we have in Europe, we have the Aegean uh, culture, uh, and we have the Beaker culture, and we come to the uh, Unedici culture, then the Tumulus culture, the Urnfield culture, and so on. And, and basically, Luristan culture, uh, sorry, uh, Lusatian culture. Uh, this would be uh, essentially these cultures in, in continental Europe. This is now the Iron Age. So if we look at these, uh, we have three distinct breaks. The, one of the reasons why uh, we can make these breaks right here. Look at this consistent break at around 2200 BC. All these cultures ended. The early Bronze Age ended, the, the Akkadians ended, the Old Kingdom of Egypt ended, the Beaker culture ended. Uh, and that break, we say, is the break between the early Bronze, the Middle Bronze. Well, what, why was there a break? In archaeology, we date these cultural changes by the, the cessation of practices and, and activities. So material culture changes dramatically. Ceramics change uh, dramatically. And if those cultures are wiped out, a whole new set of styles comes in. And this is one of the ways that we archaeologists work on chronology. And there's, so something happened here that was pretty much almost at least global in the old world. But it happened again right about here about 1500 BCE. Uh, so the Middle Bronze Age changed to then the Late Bronze. So uh, uh, in the Near East, uh, we have uh, cultures uh, change, the Neo-Assyrians and Kassites and so on, uh, uh, Mari, and then uh, Assyria, of course, is going to change. Uh, the Middle Kingdom in Egypt changes, and the, the capital moves up to Thebes, upriver. Uh, and then here we have these big changes. So each one of these changes, now there's a very significant date here, 1175 or so BCE, the end of the Late Bronze Age and what follows the Dark Ages of uh, what we call the, the second millennium BCE. Uh, and somebody has written really well about this, the year civilization ended, and that's Eric Klein, who will be the, uh, uh, Anthony Rabatschek uh, lecture, memorial lecture with his wife, Diana Klein, uh, at Stanford uh, in next May. Uh, and Diana was a student of Tony Rabatschek. Uh, but this is a brilliant book. And notice the New York Times uh, and the New Yorker writer, Adam Gopnik, uh, who says, astonishing with eerie relevance. So 1177 BCE is a year that civilization collapsed. And we know on the record that uh, there was enormous climate change uh, was one of the primary factors for this. Uh, and the civil unrest, uh, the migrations that follow, uh, political uh, problems, all kinds of chaos ensue. And we're gonna see the role of climate here shortly. So this is a brilliant book. I'm sure many of you have read it. New York Times bestseller and so on. Uh, and let's go back to Mesopotamia here. And let's just look here along the, uh, the Euphrates Tigris watershed. And some of you may know that uh, seven or 8,000 years ago, what we call uh, today the Neolithic period, uh, the monsoon winds used to come all the way across. They used to go west, all the way across from the Indian Ocean. And this used to be savanna and grasslands, and the winds came and brought a lot of rainfall here. But desertification followed massive climate change. As far as we know, it had nothing to do with humans in any causal situation, but uh, definitely uh, the, the desert and the empty quarter, Rubal Kali, everything that ensued uh, meant that uh, life was no longer easy. And it's sort of a parallel to the Garden of Eden getting kicked out of Eden story. 
that you now you had to work for everything. Uh, you had to you had to sow seeds. You had to live live along rivers and so on. And so the great fertile crescent developed along rivering civilizations. People started farming because they they couldn't necessarily just live off uh, nomadic hunting and ga uh, gathering. And here you can see part of that early uh, that Neolithic Ubayid culture, the middle of the millennium, the third, uh, the, the, in this case, the sixth millennium to fifth millennium BCE. And the Persian Gulf uh, at one time was uh, much deeper uh, in land. And now if we look at this map, some of you may know that this area of the Persian Gulf right here, uh, this with the Zagros Mountains in Iran, this now in Iraq, uh, this is the most mapped petroleum uh, area in the world. And we now know underneath the surface of the Persian Gulf, there are thousands, if not millions, of stumps of trees under the mud. They, they've been preserved because this was once forested. So uh, much shallower uh, at one time than it is today. It's, of course, changed. Uh, and so this was forested. Some say this was Dilmun. Dilmun, the Sumerian word for paradise, equivalent to Eden. But things changed climate changed and civilization changed accordingly. Now, here, that change that I mentioned, the end of the early Bronze Age, somewhere around 23 to 2200 BCE. Notice here's an article about climate change and old world collapse in the third millennium BC, uh, a Springer book. Uh, and notice the second uh, uh, part down there as well is about climate change that disrupted the, and basically destroyed the Akkadian Empire. And the pollen record is one of the best evidences, what we call palynology. Uh, if, if there are trees, and even uh, taking into account wind distribution of pollen, uh, a pollen envelope, a pollen uh, migration pattern, if, it, it tells us that uh, even if it's somewhat aeolian wind blown, you can pretty much reproduce what climate was there by the pollen. And we have a dearth of pollen suddenly around 2300 BCE, which means that trees were dying or not producing uh, pollen. And so again, this fluctuation in weather uh, was probable part of the cause of the fall of the Akkadians. Uh, and you can read others about this. Uh, climate change uh, was definitely a factor in the end of the early Bronze Age. Now, just today, if you take archaeology news, you know that uh, Timothy Paukatet's article uh, on Cahokia, if you've been to the Cahokia Mounds uh, in Illinois uh, and around that area around the Mississippi Valley, between 700 to 1400 CE, common era, these were great mound building people. They grew corn. Uh, they had a high civilization, relatively speaking. This was the medieval climate optimum from the 9th to the 13th century. But notice, something happened uh, in the 13th century. They changed their whole culture because the rains stopped. So uh, it was, it was a, a, a very uh, large uh, climate event over about 50 years that caused the Hokia civilization to collapse. Uh, and it, it didn't happen all at once. But many of their cultural practices changed as a result. So th this is true. Uh, we can see it uh, in the, the area of the New World. And uh, of course, uh, in a book I wrote last year on archaeology of the Bible, chapter 10 is on these four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, where I talk about of course, climate change, and then followed by famine, followed by malnutrition, followed by malnutrition leading to disease, and autoimmune systems being uh, hammered, and then disease followed by chaos, uh, war, people competing for the same resources, and death. Uh, now, let's look at the seed picture. Here's a famous uh, painting by Peter Bruegel about harvesting grain. And this is interesting because in the 16th century, this was the epitome 
of safety and health was in your grain harvest. Uh, and and uh, here's this big autumnal picture of a rich grain harvest, essentially uh, in the Netherlands, because this was life. The food was life, grain uh, was life. Now, grain supply tied to climate is fascinating uh, because food security and food insecurity is basic to what we have, uh, what, what, what we're growing in our crops. And some of you know that in the past few years, uh, some of the upper Missouri River uh, in the Dakotas has been hammered either by flooding uh, or by drought. And as a result, uh, not just the U.S., but it's, uh, it's been other places too, and the world food supply of grain, uh, the reserve, the grain reserve is down right now considerably. It's probably 50% uh, of less of what it was uh, uh, in 20, uh, it was, let's say in 1975, it's probably dropped uh, an enormous amount of grain reserve uh, in those ensuing decades. So let's talk about grain and what you do and your harvest. So this is a, uh, a graph I produced uh, for an article I wrote on climate change in, in early 2009. So how ancient civilizations could collapse with climatic perturbances. And we call this the principle of diminishing returns. I say we, I, I'm not saying I've invented it. I'm sure other people have used something similar. But if you talk about grain values in bushels, if you talk about a perturbance, either drought or flood, Let's assume that, uh, let's just grab some numbers out of the air. It's by no means the given that you, all your crops are gonna yield this, this amount, but let's say you, your farm produces 100 bushels of grain in a normal year. But let's say you have a climate perturbance in the following year and your grain uh, harvest is reduced. Now this is assuming only a 25% drop in the, the normal year to the first bad year. So if you have a, a, a normal drop of 25%, that may not heavily impact you, uh, but what you always do, you usually reserve at least 10% of your seed. You don't eat it, you reserve it for planting the next year. So if you have a, if you have a crop yield of 100 bushels, you plant 10 bushels of seed, but then you only yield 75 instead of 100, so it's not a one-to-one -one yield. And now, in that second year, you're a little impacted. Uh, you have 25% uh, less, but you are still gonna only probably plant 10%. So this time you only plant seven and a half bushels for seed. Then if you have another bad year, so blue is normal, and then the second bad year, if you have another 25% drop, because it's the second year of perturbation, either drought or flood, you have 56 bushels, uh, and you're gonna plant maybe five and a half bushels uh, but you can see you're now only planting half of what you would normally plant. And essentially, you only have half of the amount of food in a second year of drought than you had in the first year, normal year. So now malnutrition is beginning to affect the very young and the very old. The population's likely uh, decreasing faster than increasing. And you have to think about livestock, the, the huge farm animals that you've farm with and you plow with and, and so on, uh, they're going to be affected. So your, your farm livestock. So if you have a bad year, three bad years, that's really bad. Uh, assuming only a 25% drop, what do you plant? You know, four bushels? Four bushels instead of 10. I mean, you're now down to less than half of what you would normally have. Well, this diminishing returns idea is assuming only a 25% drop per consecutive year. But Probably, it, it, there's, there's a likely compounding factor of 25% year one, 33% year one to year two, 40% year two to three. So uh, it's more likely now that you're having severe malnutrition. And malnutrition uh, is going to definitely yield uh, a, a, an immune system deficiency. Famine sets up malnutrition, which sets up weakness uh, and sets up uh, essentially dangerous levels of uh, possibilities for uh, uh, some kind of uh, disease that you could have. So 
in this case, in this particular scenario, uh, climate change yields famine, which yields malnutrition, which yields disease. And essentially, this is the pattern that we see throughout history again and again and again. Uh, now, so the four horsemen of the apocalypse, we, we, we said it's not just the future, it's also history. In fact, it's, it, it's not a one-time event, it's all throughout history. So it's really what were and are, and we have to assume will be in future. I don't want to say when. So we've already seen this. So famine leads to, well, climate change can lead to famine. Famine can lead to disease. Uh, disease can lead to war and death. But we're dealing with a pandemic that's at this point unrelated to the other three. Although uh, a colleague, uh, explorer uh, for National Geographic, Jane Goodall, you may know for her, her for her work in primates in Africa. Jane Goodall has said that uh, this coronavirus we have today is because we have uh, we've we've changed animal habitats and we're the animals that were far from us are now in too close contact with us. Uh, she says it's likely going to happen again. The proximity of uh, life forms sharing the same habitats, which didn't necessarily happen before. That's her uh, view of it. Now we have lots of images of uh, famine throughout history. Uh, this is famine because of a siege, the siege of Lachish that the Assyrians had, but there's no question that famine led to malnutrition and the weakness that also led to disease, uh, cholera among other uh, pandemic problems. Now, sometimes we have technologically uh, good consequences. In the case of the Middle Ages, the great death, the great, the great uh, what's called the Black Death, population loss actually led to some inventiveness. We had some automation that took place when you have far fewer workers to grind the grain. Actually, windmills were a, were a good result of that because windmills, wind-turned uh, turbines, as it were, ground, ground, grind, grind the grain, and so you don't have to have so many people in the farm doing it. And now there's a philosophic consequence as well. If you've read Camus' The Plague, you know that one of the interesting uh, offsets and results of a plague is that, hey, God abandoned us. Uh, and you know, in Camus, even the priests die from this. So there's a certain amount of religious skepticism. And we see that coming out of the Renaissance, out of the, the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Uh, people aren't necessarily just follow what churches say uh, if they don't have the answers. So now uh, we, we looked at this horse. Let's look more closely. And I want you to examine the bow. Do you see that that is a compound bow? That's definitely a bow from the Near East. Uh, this this uh, uh, compound bow was associated with the Near East and the Golden Horde, uh, uh, whether Scythians, Parthians uh, early on, and then uh, 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 Mongol and Golden Horde later, we know that the Great Bubonic Plague or the Great Black Death of 1346 to 51 came from the East. We're even told that some of these uh, marauding armies threw infected dead bodies uh, over walls to infect the populations to spread this even faster. Uh, and nobody's safe from it, except for those who are already in isolation, as we saw in quarantine, as that anonymous master of death depicted. So this is, the, the, the very astute painter here is well aware that this is coming from the East, which is exactly the pattern. And we're gonna get to that later. So let's, let's talk about what can cause dramatic short-term climate change as well. All kinds of factors. Um, we know that in the Roman world, deforestation of the Atlas Mountains, deforestation uh, of other uh, uh, areas uh, for agriculture and for burning wood, for fuel, uh, for baking things, for smelting uh, lead or whatever, we definitely have some, some climate change that we're uh, at times 
caused by humans. But notice what happened in the year 535. This is all over the world, from Syria to Constantinople to Britain to uh, Scandinavia. Here, here are some people who said what happened in the year 535. The sun became dark and its darkness lasted for 18 months. Each day it shone for about four hours and still this light was only a feeble shadow. The fruits did not ripen and the wine tasted like sour grapes. Well, not enough sun, not enough uh, bricks, not enough sugar level. And this is in Syria, Michael the Syrian. Notice in Constantinople, uh, Christianus Johannes Leidus says, the sun became dim for nearly the whole year so that the fruits were killed in an unseasonable time. Uh, uh, or they dropped, or in some cases, uh, fruit froze on trees, even uh, in summer. Notice in the uh, De Exidio Britonum, the Annals of Cambria, the Ang Anglo-Saxon Chronicles here of Gilda says, there was a mysterious cloud that obscured the sun and moon for a whole year. What is this mysterious cloud? Hmm. Well, then notice the Scandinavian described this, the writer describes this as the thimble winter and the twilight of the gods, sort of a, sort of a Gotterdamaru. Notice this Scandinavian uh, says, the sunshine of summer had somehow lost their glory, were transforth, thenceforth pale and faint. At last there came a winter such as neither man nor God had ever seen before. The days were short and dark. Blinding storms followed fast upon each other and left mountains of snow behind. Fierce winds swept the sky and troubled the sea. The bitter air froze the very hearts of men into sullen despair. The deepest rivers were fast bound with ice. The fiercest animals died in their lairs. There was no warmth in the sun, and even the br icy brightness of the stars was dimmed by drifting snow. Notice the author says, the whole earth was buried in a winter so bitter that the gods themselves shivered in Asgard. This is described everywhere. And by the way, it happened in South America too. We have cultures in South America that end, that collapse. So this was a global phenomenon. Uh, what could cause a global phenomenon of climate change? Well, several things. Um, uh, we, we know that there was a huge comet collision over the Earth or on the Earth in 535. Uh, you can read about this uh, in the Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, we also know that Krakatoa blew up in this enormous plinian eruption that sent megatons of volcanic ash into the sky. So this is probably the source uh, of that. And we also have from accounts of Chinese historians uh, from uh, basically Song and Tang dynasties, we, they record all these volcanic eruptions in Indonesia not just Krakatoa, but along Java, the ring of fire of Pacific of, of volcanism, uh, the huge plectonic boundary. So uh, this tectonic repetition, this cataclysm, put an enormous amount of volcanic ash and dust in the sky, which obscured the sunlight. It, it mitigated, it reduced sunshine dramatically. Uh, it, it was multiple events. It wasn't just one volcanic eruption, it was multiple, and it was also likely this huge comet collision uh, that uh, uh, put an, an, an enormous amount of spicules of silica, basically volcanic glass spicules into the atmosphere. Now, here we have a bioarchaeology uh, in the Pax Britannia, the, about the time, the, the legendary fall of Arthur, uh, the Pax Britannica. And uh, this is Bailey's slice through time looking at dendrochronology. So looking at tree rings. So if you, if you know that tree ring dating, dendrochronology, uh, in, in, in wet years, you have usually much bigger rings. And in, in years that are impacted, you have much smaller rings. And notice that we have on uh, several different plants, we have oaks and we have uh, whitthorn. Notice that right here, there was an event plummeting. So huge growth drop right about after that event. So in the next, the, the few years following this saw the, the growth restricted enormously in these plants. Two only that we can see here, but there were more than that, of course. 
Uh, now, Procopius, who wrote the secret history and the history of the Vandal Wars in Constantinople, talks about the year 536. He talks about the, this year first, 535 to 536. Uh, he, he says the sun uh, gave forth its light without brightness. It was like the sun in eclipse. Notice he says uh, other things, uh, you know, uh, basically we know that, that we have the Krakatoa and other Indonesian volcanoes, uh, and we have the comet collision. Uh, and by the way, these little spherules, these, these silica spherules show up in Greenland ice layers that are evidence for that uh, comet collision. So essentially he's repeating what we already saw from the Syrian, Michael the Syrian, uh, and Priscus. And what happens right after that, within a few years after the fact that the fruit froze on trees and there was no sunshine, plague hit Constantinople from the east. Why? Well, the devastation of the plague, people were migrating all over the world because of this event and reduced food led to uh, impacted autoimmune systems. So reduced the, the, the sun's loss, agricultural calamities led to famine, which led to malnutrition, which set people up for this weakness and a, a propensity to be more impacted by disease. So, you know, the vectors here, uh, we have climate change with the ash and, and collision comet material in the atmosphere, and then ship traffic uh, carried this plague. It came again from the east and moved west, and essentially Constantinople was really hit hard. Uh, you may have read uh, uh, the book Justinian's Flea, but here he talks about what happens with this pestilence. The whole human race uh, came close to being annihilated, says Procopius. We don't know uh, if, if this is hyperbole, uh, but he describes uh, that it started from the Egyptians, came to Alexandria, it reached Byzantium in the second year. So uh, basically, uh, this, the second year it reached Byzantium, meaning the first year it was in the Nile, and then the second year hit Byzantium. So 536, uh, 537, 538, uh, it had already started elsewhere before it came to Constantinople. Then he talks about uh, basically what we call Yersinia pestis, uh, the the bacterium that lives inside the flea uh, that is basically carrying bubonic plague. And he talks about the symptoms here. And he talks about 5,000 dying a day to 10,000 a day. This sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? And then notice it led uh, to violence, chaos, confusion, disorder. Uh, and it's essentially what we're talking about, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So in this case, uh, the original story doesn't mention climate change, but we go from climate change to the horsemen that we can call famine, which then we lead to uh, famine. And then we have plague because the agent of plague is malnutrition, setting people uh, uh, up everywhere to this. And then the chaos, civil war, and then death. So this is, Procopius describing this same phenomenon. And notice uh, you had 500,000 people living in Constantinople in 540, but by about the year 600, uh, uh, literally in, in, in a period of uh, two generations, you had a 40% loss of population. So death uh, outraced birth. Now that's fascinating because what happened is this, you can see in 560, the, the pink is the Byzantine Empire, including uh, Italy and uh, North Africa. So that's uh, essentially what, right after the plague had hit, the Byzantine Emperor shrunk enormously so that essentially, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Byzantium was only half of what it was and then the barbarians, who'd also been migrating because of climate change, uh, they had take, 
taken up what had been the Western Byzantium. And now there's a power vacuum. And uh, even in Turkey, Asia Minor, and uh, uh, this whole area of, of the Levant, Egypt, the Byzantine influence can no longer extend itself. It can't put armies out there to hold the limes, the boundaries and posts. And the vacuum that was left was filled very quickly by Islam. So the demise of Byzantium uh, led in, in a certain respect to the rise of Islam. I'm not saying there, that's, that the causation is necessarily absolutely direct, but the power vacuum of Byzantium's loss opened up this territory to a whole new religious culture. Now, uh, as we said, it starts off with climate change. Climate change, famine, no food to eat, fruit froze on trees, uh, malnutrition, uh, the weakness of people uh, setting, them up, setting them up for disease, in this case, bubonic plague, and then all the chaos, war, death that followed. Now, let's move forward from essentially 700 years. Uh, after Byzantium uh, lost control of uh, the Mediterranean, at least the West, let's move to about 1300 or so. Now, this is temperature variations. Uh, the, in the Alps, we have three latitude studies of alpine snow depth. And just to point out uh, that um, uh, if uh, here, uh, for example, uh, we have this period right here uh, is talking about something happening uh, with, with uh, snow depth and temperature changes. And here's another one, the Finland drought and the flood record. So we had a cooling uh, in the dark ages and then what's called the medieval warm period. And then suddenly, right about 1300, something started happening and there was a huge drop uh, here. Uh, as we can see, there's, a, there's an enormous, uh, there's a cooling that's taking place here. And if we know what happened, Around 1300, uh, there were all kinds of Icelandic volcanoes erupting, and not just Icelandic, also Indonesian. Again, these are recorded in, in Chinese historians, uh, not the Iceland ones, but the Indonesian ones, the Ring of Fire ones. So again, it was a, a pretty much across many latitudes and longitudes, and essentially, that led to diminished food supply. It led to famine in Europe. And the famine in Europe, for example, this is a recent, uh, just know the Pinatubo eruption in 2003 to 2006, three years, put out about 6 million tons of ash into the sky. And we did have some ensuing climatic perturbances because of this reduced sunshine uh, the years uh, then and slightly following. Now, here in, in uh, Iceland, Laka Gigar volcano responsi was responsible for a huge atmospheric devastation that led to the Little Ice Age. Remember, there was a period in the 18th century, late 18th century, where you could walk across English Channel on ice because of the Little Ice Age. Uh, it, it was so cold that uh, ice formed on the English Channel. We had, this is the period, too, when the great romantics are writing about these huge glacial ice sheets uh, in Mont Blanc, you know, Mary Shelley and, and her compatriots. So you also had, now let's go back to uh, 1340, we had the Krusevik volcano that erupted in 1340, and then Chinese historians, five Indonesian super volcano, sort of plinian eruptions, of the phrase, that put out an enormous amount of ash. And what happened as a result, was the Arctic ice pack grew enormously across uh, Greenland uh, in this time period because of reduced sunshine. It was much colder. So the cold temperatures led to crop failures, led to famine, led to malnutrition, led to immune uh, system uh, uh, basically opening up peoples uh, to uh, unhealthy uh, times where they were much more susceptible to disease. Now let's look at the Black Plague, or bubonic plague, and we know it started about here, came uh, in 1346, 
basically, this is the, the that end of that Golden Horde invasion. It came across the Caspian, the Caucasus, hit Constantinople first, then hit uh, Cyrus, then uh, Alexandria, and it came over. It basically took out uh, Palermo, Sicily. It was hit really hard. And so all the port cities were hit hard. And after that, after it hit the port cities from shipping, it moved inland. And then eventually, you can see 1348, 1349, 1350, you can see it moving ever northward. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the plague was really bad uh, in certain places. Some suspect uh, that possibly up to 50% of the Scandinavian population died uh, in places uh, like Halmstad, Oslo, Bergen, and Trondheim uh, because of the plague. And, and hence that movie, Seventh Seal of Ingmar Bergman, that describes this. So the at advance year by year led to huge devastations. We have, for example, whole funerary islands in the Venetian uh, uh, islets uh, where we can see bubonic plague, where they just were buried by the thousands, uh, these bubonic plague victims. Uh, and that's where you have Dr. Pestus, Dr. Pest, with that mask. You think our masks are problematic? Look at this mask uh, that they had to wear to keep what they felt, these masks protected them from uh, contagion. Interesting, uh, because of the Jewish sanitation laws, the ghetto of Venice had a far lower rate of infection because they practiced sanitation, <coughs> quarantine, cleansing, washing everything, burning of material. And in some places in Italy, the Jews were persecuted and slaughtered because they were felt to be in league with this disease because they were protected by following their Levitical laws. What a, what a horrible uh, result for uh, being, uh, you know, taking good care of themselves with good sanitation and hygiene. Uh, I don't want to talk about modern corollaries about, you know, people who refuse to wear masks, but, uh, you know, to scoff at something that is airborne is really stupid. Uh, now, uh, in St. Martin's Churchyard in Basel, uh, uh, two years ago, I was working uh, uh, there, and uh, uh, it was interesting because uh, there was an excavation of the churchyard, and there were literally bubonic plague victims that had been buried in that churchyard from easily six or seven hundred years before. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you know, some of you're a little cautious about touching those bones. But um, plague victims, there are whole trenches filled with plague victims from the mid 14th century, from 1346 to 1351, because of the, the fact that it just decimated between 25 to 60 percent of the population in different places, localized differently, and not everyone was affected the same. You may recall Boccaccio's Decameron, the 10 days of isolation that these aristocrats fled to the countryside to tell these tales, essentially because of that plague. There are so many stories about it. European artwork is filled with death references from this time period in the 14th century as well. There are so many images of skeleton in medieval uh, uh, manuscripts. Now, I want to jump quickly to what's going on right now. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the Alps, and this is the Gornergrat Glacier. And uh, this is it. I'm standing, I took this picture at 9,000 feet. And you see this vegetation right there? You can tell glacial regression's pace by looking at what regrowth happens. And these are new trees right here. And they're essentially, some of these trees are only 30 years old. Uh, and in, but, but in, from here to here, this glacier has receded essentially in 30 years, uh, a quarter of a mile. Ah, 30 years, a quarter mile. That's, that's a lot of glacial regression. We can date it. I study lichen. Some of you know that lichenometry. And we look at when lichen regrowth starts on the rocks 
and we can date that as a chronometer, particularly what's called the map like in Rhizocarpin Geographicum uh, and its other corollary, Xanthoria elegans. So we can date by lichen uh, glacial regression, and we can also use it for an archaeological chronometer. I want to jump here. This is something at the Klein of Matterhorn. I took this picture last year, and you're seeing something here that you're not supposed to see. This is really bad if you see this. What are we looking at here? Blue ice. Blue ice is old ice. It's thousands of years old, uh, and it's blue because of the light trapped in there and the way that really, really old ice gets extremely consolidated. So if you're seeing blue ice, that's bad. That means you're seeing something that's melting fast. And what was deep in this, under the surface of the glacier is suddenly now at the, the flush of the, 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 the head of the glacier. So all this blue ice here means it's super, super old ice that's suddenly exposed uh, and fast melting, and that is bad. That's what's happening in the Alps. In 25 years, I've seen about a hmm, at least a 20% loss of glaciers. Uh, and my friends have tracked this, and we who work at Ash Graphic have tracked this. Something really bad happened in 2018. Uh, I'm going to go there. The, the, I was at the head of the Rhine River and the head of the Rhone River. Now, there are many different heads, but I was at the sources, multiple sources of those rivers, and there was just a trickle. There was no snow. And so as a result, the Rhine River and the Rhone River really, really went dry. And look, you're standing on the edge of the, the Rhine River in Cologne right here. This is Cologne. And look at this. This isn't normal right here. And same thing along here along the Rhine River. It was so dry that on a National Geographic uh, wine cruise I was uh, leading as an ex expeditions expert, we had to get off the boats because there was only nine inches of draft in the Rhine River. So we, we had to get off our Rhine cruise and uh, go by bus. This happened all throughout the Rhine River. Uh, that the, the cruise ships couldn't go because the river had dried up. And then notice, this is also something that happened. You may have heard about the hunger stones in the bottoms of some of these rivers, like the Elbe River or other rivers in Germany. They have these markings on the stones. And often it says things like, if you see me, weep, because this is bad news. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, this has happened before, uh, but uh, these, river, these rocks are now exposed uh, in 2018, basically way below them. Now, uh, before I uh, mention that, uh, uh, one of our family members who lived in the Rhine River Valley for about six years got to know all the farmers and dairy farmers in the area of St. Galen. And in 2018, something uh, because of the rivers drying up because if there was no snow, the alpine meadows burnt. There was no grazing for the cows in the St. Galen area around books, uh, grobs, uh, uh, socks. Uh, and uh, this area, uh, they normally bring their cows down uh, in late August, September from the alpine meadows. But they had to bring them down in 2018 in July because there was no grazing. It had burned up, dried up completely. Uh, and the Swiss Army was going to Lake, uh, the Bowdoin Sea, Lake Constance, and having huge buckets, uh, house-sized buckets of water, bringing up to the meadows, but it didn't do any good. And the Swiss did something that I've never heard of before. They didn't have enough food supply for their cows. And I'm told that the dairy farmers in this region slaughtered 20 percent of their dairy cows because they had no food for the winter. And these Swiss love their cows. So that's, that's uh, unusual. Uh, you know, think of, you know, Swiss milk chocolate and so on, uh, and Swiss cheese. Uh, that was a bad year, 2018. Uh, and the problem is, if you look at an annual precipitation chart, from one year to the next, it may look pretty much the same. The annual precipitation may be similar, but it's when it comes that's critical. 
if it comes at the wrong time, if your rain comes uh, uh, and if, if it's not cold enough to turn it into snow and then ice, and basically what is a glacier? Well, it's frozen water, it's ice. And if, a, if the glaciers are receding, uh, essentially uh, what this means uh, is the warmer temperatures uh, and if the land is too warm, the rain falls and it won't turn to snow or so it doesn't count as, as, as snowpack water for irrigation, farming, uh, drinking and so on. And if it comes at the wrong time, again, if the rain comes uh, uh, at, at a time of the year when it's not snow converted, it'll just run off. And so that's why you can't just look at the volume of precipitation per year. You have to also look when it hits, when it comes. Uh, you can have all the snow melting in February if it's too warm. Anyway, I don't want to go into too much detail, but uh, now I've spent a lot of time working on this. So I'm going to go back to Utsi very quickly. As I said earlier, uh, when you look at the glaciers and you look at all the reduction in the common uh, you know, right now, uh, this this permanent glacial ice zone is definitely reduced, and essentially, right now, we know this is why China built the Three Rivers Dam a few years ago because the Himalaya uh, glacial melt was so heavy. And think of it: fifty percent of the world's population lives in Himalaya. Uh, glacial watersheds. So the Mekong, the Irrawaddy, the Brahmaputra, the Ganges, the Yellow, the Yangtze, and so all these rivers where half the world's population live. So now Utsi. Uh, Utsi was literally in a glacier for 5,000 years. That means that there was very little fluctuation in the last 5,000 years. It's the glacial reduction sense that we can measure so acutely. So there is evidence for anyone who may uh, want to deny uh, climate change. If Utsi had been exposed at any time in that 5,000 years, we wouldn't have Utsi today. He was perfectly cryogenically almost frozen uh, for those 5,000 years until 1991. Now, I want to kind of draw this to a conclusion. This earth that we live on, uh, we're not always the best stewards of it. Um, right now, as we speak, with rising uh, uh, marine uh, water temperatures, we're seeing more hurricanes. We're seeing much more extreme weather uh, than we've seen perhaps before. And maybe we've been lulled in the past few hundred years. Maybe the climate change in the past few hundred years, uh, maybe, maybe normal wasn't really normal. Maybe we were lulled by its stability. And I, we can't afford to be lulled by that stability any longer. We have to make adaptations. And I wanna, I wanna kind of go to a positive note here um, because we need hope. And uh, humans are extremely adaptable. I wrote an article for the Encyclopedia of Global Warming a few years ago about what Israel did. Uh, now, from 1960 to 1985, Israel planted millions of pine trees. And all the kids in the Moshabim and, and the Ketsuvim, all these kids spent their holidays linking rubber hoses together to water those little pine seedlings. And they took, they were hardy pines. Uh, they were Near Eastern pines, kind of like the Aleppo pine, can endure a certain amount of, of drought. And those pine trees grew up so that by 1985, you had uh, thousands of acres of millions of pine trees growing along the hills of Israel. And what happened, the uh, water, and remember the Mediterranean is an evaporitic basin. More water evaporates out of the Mediterranean than flows in from all those rivers, believe it or not. So it's a huge evaporitic basin. And the west, the, the winds from the west blew that water vapor, that evaporated water across. It hit the hills of Israel between 1960 and 85. And before, when there were no trees there, the heat of the earth just evaporated that water. But because they planted trees along those hills, up to 
basically a thousand feet high. It changed the condensation dew point, and Israel's rainfall increased over, it, it trebled, literally, from 11 inches a year to 30 some inches a year in that 20 year period. Literally, Israel made the desert green. So, you know, uh, you don't have to be a tree hugger to know that trees have a wonderful uh, addition. Not only do they change the temperature, they defenestrate the heat by their shade. It's the shade that's the air conditioner here under the tree. Not only that, they take in our carbon dioxide and give us back oxygen. So, you know, we can say plant more trees. I'm really thrilled one of my Stanford students uh, spent one of his uh, um, out years planting 11,000 trees around the world. I'm really proud of Matt. Anyway, uh, it's not just the plant trees. Israel did something else that was phenomenal. At Ashkelon, they built a desalination plant because the parts per thousands of salt in uh, the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean, pretty high salinity level. Uh, maybe the Red Sea is the only place where it's really that much higher. And we'll talk about that too, because what Israel did, it built a desalination plant to provide more water for its agricultural needs. And it was completely solar powered. Uh, and it had these uh, parabolic solar mirror uh, collectors. So it didn't use fossil fuels or any other kind of electricity. It generated electricity, solar powered parabolic mirror, mirrors uh, as collectors desalinated, I don't know how many uh, megatons of salt water and gave fresh water as a result. This results were so spectacular that Saudi Arabia asked the Israeli engineers if they could build a plant on the Red Sea to do the same thing, desalination. So what's the takeaway here? Well, climate change is real. It's happened a lot through history. It has brought civilizations to its knees. Uh, we measure as archeologists, the end of the early Bronze Age, the middle Bronze Age by climatic catastrophes uh, that changed civilizations. We measure the change from the Middle Bronze Age to the Late Bronze Age by, again, climatic catastrophes. Uh, think of, for example, uh, a, a catastrophe like the eruption uh, of uh, the island of Thera, uh, somewhere at the end of the Middle Bronze Age and near the beginning of the Late Bronze Age. Was this a precipitating factor to the loss of Minoan civilization. Many believe that it was. Uh, uh, the sort of Atlantis that Plato may describe in the Phaedra, where we know that uh, Spiridon, Mar Marinatus, you know, uh, Spiridon Marinatus excavated in Omnisos Harbor in Crete all the remnants of the Minoan fleet that were destroyed by the tsunamis from the eruption of Thera. So they kind of lost their thalassocracy, many believe. So, Climate change from whatever perturbances or catastrophes happen can lead to civilization collapse by those four horsemen of the apocalypse, famine being the one that we're really concentrating on here. But the famine leads to susceptibility to disease by malnutrition. So wherever we stand today, here we are in a standalone pandemic, the coronavirus, but is it? Is it possible that the pandemic of coronavirus is because of uh, animals that are sharing too close of a habitat where that wouldn't have happened uh, decades ago? And it's, it's basically uh, been happening now and according to Jane Goodall, may happen even more frequently as habitats of animals shrink and we're competing for the same resources. So the four horsemen in the apocalypse, uh, are part of history and will likely happen again. Are we seeing a standalone or is it related? Who can say? But um, I think we need to think of hope. Uh, we're definitely going to have a, a re-enactment of the Paris Climate Accord uh, after January. We're going to take it more seriously as a nation, although many of us 
in California have always uh, believed that we had a responsibility to uh, change our our emissions uh, of of fossil fuel, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, and you know we're not necessarily a very a terribly green state in California, but uh, uh, it's fascinating to think that we as humans can adapt, and I think that is part of the key to our species success. Uh, let's hope. Here we are. Uh, it, near the end of 2020, a year that we probably want to see end very quickly, uh, but we want to see it end in stability. Uh, and um, I don't know what your wishes are for the new year that will be coming. Uh, a stable transition will be one of them. And I suspect a, an effective, speedy vaccine for coronavirus are two of our uh, pending wishes for the coming year. Thank you for letting me share on the effects of climate change and collapse of civilization via the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Patrick, thank you, that was amazing. I wanna thank Dr. Hunt for sharing his time and wisdom. This lecture will be available on the AIA's YouTube channel if you would like to share with friends. If you enjoyed this lecture, we encourage you to donate either on our website at www.archaeological.org slash donate, or simply text donate to 833-965-2840, or even better, become a member and benefit from all our events. Thank you so much for joining us today.